so we have uh, Keith Bell. Um, Keith is wearing his Climate Change Committee hat and he is standing in for the Climate Change Committee's Dave Joffe, who unfortunately hasn't been able to join us uh, for, uh, for, for some personal reasons this morning. Uh, we have Mike Bradshaw, who's also one of UKIRK's directors, Professor of Global Energy at Warwick Business School, uh, and so sort of all-round expert on, on gas markets and, uh, oil and, and oil and gas markets. Simon Verley, uh, who's uh, uh, one of our fellows of the Energy Institute, a partner and head of energy at KPMG, one of the architects of um, the, 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 the previous round of electricity market reform during his time at, in, in government at what was then GEC. Uh, we have uh, Jen Baxter, who's engineering director at a sustainable energy company called Proteum, former chief engineer at the IFMEC E. Uh, Doug Parr, who's chief scientist and policy director at Greenpeace, and Rachel Carey, who's uh, heading up the, the current uh, or forthcoming review of electricity market arrangements at Bayes. Um, we need, I need to ask all of those who are making presentations to, to keep strictly to time, and I will interrupt you uh, if you don't. Everyone was great at keeping to time uh, in the morning session, and that gave us more time uh, for, for, for QA. And the running order, uh, I will quickly remind myself of, uh, we have 15 minute slots. If you can do it in less than you get uh, uh, the uh, virtual uh, um, pint of beer. Uh, we've got Keith, then Mike, then Simon, then Jen, and then we're getting some responses from Doug and Rachel, uh, and we'll open it up to wider Q and A. Okay, thanks very much, Rob, and hopefully my slides are up there. So, uh, yeah, as Rob mentioned, uh, I'm, I'm deputising this morning for David Joffe, my co colleague from the Climate Change Committee. So I'm a member of the uh, of the committee, so it's a sort of a part-time job for me. Um, and on the committee, I kind of take a role in taking a particular interest in the power sector and in, in what's happening in Scotland and Northern Ireland. And yeah, kind of the rest of my my kind of employment is at, at the University of Strathclyde, and uh, I'm also involved in the UK Energy Research Centre and leading one of the themes on energy system infrastructure transition. Okay, so what I want to do just in the next sort of ten minutes really is to set the scene a little bit for the rest of our discussion on uh, sort of longer term changes, if you like, and and some of this will pick up hopefully on some of the questions that were raised in the first half of this morning. And you know, a big part of what we're aiming at, of course, is uh, advised by uh, the Climate Change Committee. So, you know, the major advice uh, in in the last sort of uh, couple of years has been in relation to you know advising on a net zero uh, greenhouse gas emissions target by, by 2050 for for the UK. Uh, and as the means of getting there, getting the right sort of pathway, uh, so that we properly address our sort of cumulative emissions and our, our share of it. Uh, the, the various carbon budgets. So the sixth carbon budget uh, advice was was given at the end of uh, 2020. Uh, and you can see the kind of main impact of that on the slide there. And that also uh, advised uh, what we should be doing in terms of our uh, nationally determined contribution as part of the uh, UNFCCC uh, sort of global uh, emissions reduction sort of process. So the question, of course, is how, how do we achieve all of this? And our analysis in the CCC suggested that there are four uh, main areas in which we could meet, in which we should meet the six carbon budget. Uh, so, I mean, these are sort of illustrative, really, because there were various scenarios we looked at, and there were you know, all sorts of uncertainties about exactly how technologies would develop. We talked uh, in, in the morning about uh, different kinds of uh, behaviours, uh, you know, low carbon choices, if you like. And it's important, of course, that those choices are, ma are made available and made, made accessible. But a big part of this way in which our analysis suggests that we can meet the sixth carbon budget is through electrification, that big orange wedge uh, in the middle of that sort of rainbow of abatement. Uh, and, you know, of course, that is fundamentally uh, part of the energy system as a whole. Now, electricity, of course, isn't the only means of, of, uh, of getting energy. And you can see the chart on the left there showing electricity is a relatively small part of it at the moment relative to our use of gas and petroleum. But, 
you know, our modeling suggests really should should increase increase that proportion of electricity because we've got these low carbon sources of electricity, renewables, and uh, in particular wind and solar. Not quite such great hydro resources in this country. Uh, nuclear power is something we have used that is is you know low carbon. How much of that should be in the mix? Maybe we'll pick that up in the in the discussion in a little while. But one of the advantages of electrification is an improvement in overall energy efficiency. Uh, the processes of uh, you know heating buildings and, and water uh, or of uh, mobility become more efficient when you're using uh, electricity. Now, okay, again, we've seen in the chat that, you know, for example, the coefficient of performance of, of an air source heat pump does depend on the outside air temperature. But, you know, the various, uh, you know, uh, trials and, and modeling suggests that you can do pretty well on a kind of average year round basis. Albeit, we've still got to manage whatever the peaks are of demand. And yeah, big change, you know, that electrification uh, in large part through uh, heating it in, in, in you know, all energy in buildings and then the kind of orange way sorry, the purple wedge towards the, the top of that chart relating to surface transport so where's all this electrical energy going to come from and again this is one scenario among many there are different scenarios produced by people uh, people like the, the the electricity system operator energy system catapult bays and so on uh, but you know we can see you know gradually getting rid of unabated burning of fossil fuels and increasing the use of uh, wind and solar variable renewables, uh, but also other, other sources of electricity. So that by 2035, we should see unabated burning of gas uh, for electricity generation uh, phased out. Okay, subject to security supply considerations, but if it's sort of, I don't know, a few hours a year and a, you know, a, a few megawatt hours, um, maybe that's sort of tolerable in the short term. Uh, and about 85% of electrical energy in this scenario coming from this balanced pathway that we produced in, in the CCC via variable renewables, nuclear, and you know, some, some bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. And of course, you know, CCS being, being an important issue uh, in, in, uh, in industry and with bioenergy, a potential way of, of achieving greenhouse gas removals. But um, there will, I'll, I'll come on to it in a moment, but you know, there's obviously variation in the availability of renewables relative to demand through the year. And that last point, that last bullet, delivery of this will also require sufficient network capacity to be ready at the right time and uh, a coherent market framework to encourage the right kind of investment in the right mix of facilities. And you know, this sort of change that we're talking about here across uh, the electricity system, I think, is, is summarized on, on this slide. Uh, and that cost structure and that bottom row is, is very important, you know, in terms of you know, a big part of the cost being the fuel towards the biggest part of the cost being the capital cost uh, with, with very low short run marginal costs of producing electricity from, from uh, renewables and from nuclear power. And the penultimate row there, which we touched on in the first half this morning, about the role of the demand side. So the ability of, of uh, the use of energy to, to, to flex in terms of its timing to match the availability of the lowest carbon and cheapest resources. Uh, but also, um, yeah, whether some new kinds of demand, new kinds of use of electricity will turn up as well. And we touched again this morning on the energy security strategy that uh, was published by the government uh, in April. Um, yeah, commitments towards faster deployment of offshore wind, uh, a large and but long-term nuclear program, uh, and you know if it's if it's delivered, it goes a long way, I suppose, to meeting what what we've suggested from from the CCC. Um, but uh, the kind of exact ways of getting there not spelled out quite so much, and very little to say on the demand side. Okay, so a bit, bit of a kind of busy slide here, perhaps, but. I think this hopefully starts to get into some of those issues around the variability of, of uh, renewables relative to demand. So one way of understanding how we can meet demand through the course of a year is to plot what we would call a load duration curve. So we, we measure the load, forecast it uh, in each hour, and then we can sort those numbers from the smallest on the right to the biggest on the left. And uh, this is from some modeling that a colleague of mine at the University of Strathclyde, Callum McKeever, has done 
okay, using some numbers from the European network of transmission system operators in respect of demand, which to be honest, we, we, don't, we don't fully trust, but okay, let's just take this chart for illustrative purposes, just to get the concept across. So the dashed line is just the demand uh, sorted, you know, hour by hour, but, but from the reordering to have the, the smallest on the right and the biggest on the left. Now, if in each of those hours, you didn't just say, what's the demand? You also said, well, how much power is available from wind, solar and hydropower, then you get what, would, what we call the residual demand. And it has a sort of similar general shape, but the magnitude varies you know, a lot during the course of the year. So we've still got to meet that peak over at the left. So these are the solid lines, by the way, in different scenarios. Uh, and actually for the yellow and green lines, so these are 2030 and 2040 scenarios with lots of wind generation capacity, you can see there are you know, in the green line in 2040, many hours in which actually there's a big surplus relative to demand, or at least the demand as, as put in these scenarios, which as I say, I'm not totally sure about. So that surplus, um, well, you could export it to our neighbors. Um, we could put that energy into some form of storage and then use it, then take it out of the store to meet the, the, the peak on the left. Uh, or we could use it to manufacture hydrogen through electrolysis. So it's also important that the meeting demand, we can do it all through the year, and we do so in a low carbon way, of course, but also that we do it at least cost. So how do we meet that peak demand at least cost? And if you can't make use of all that surplus, you have to curtail the output, which means maybe turning down the output from wind farms, solar farms, or, well, it's quite difficult to turn it down from nuclear power stations. Uh, just the last point that on the network capacity. So 50 gigawatts of offshore wind, that's a lot. When it's windy, you've got to get make full use of that power. And uh, you know there is not a lot of network capacity out in the sea. But it's not just about getting it from the wind farm to the beach. We've also get it, got to get it across, across land to where the demand is. Uh, and although network costs are you know, not the biggest part of the total cost of energy, history suggests that they're one of the most difficult parts of it to deliver, especially in terms of the gaining of planning consents. And some of these, uh, you know, while we might be able to use undersea cables, well, yes, we have to, to get from the wind farms to the beach. Um, how do we get the power then through to the demand centers? You know, cables under land are very expensive. Uh, you know, can only build them in short sections. Uh, overhead lines are the cheapest way of doing it, but attract enormous opposition. And the last two major transmission overhead line projects we've built in this country took more than 10 years from uh, you know, agreement to, 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 to you know, within the, the network companies to press ahead and uh, aim to do it to commissioning. So, you know, a long time to deliver. We haven't got that amount of time to wait uh, to be able to make, make use of all the offshore wind that's promised by 2030. And just example of some, I guess, just to get a sense of scale there in terms of exports from, from Scotland to England. But Although more local energy might appear to uh, you know, be a solution to the lack of transmission network capacity, well, it really depends on where that is. And there are all sorts of other kind of uh, uh, considerations, one of which is, um, well, you know, the economies of scale or of offshore wind would, wouldn't be available to you if you're just relying totally on, on local supplies. Okay, I'll stop there and uh, actually we'll pick up some of those threads later on. Thanks very much. So thank you very much and, and thanks for the opportunity to contribute. And I think what I have to say fits very nicely with what we heard from Keith um, just now. Um, the first thing I'd say is that you know, issues around gas security, are, it's, a, it's a long-standing thread of research within Newkirk. And I think probably we could identify you know, two, two sources of uncertainty in terms of looking at the UK. Um, one is the more traditional sort of notion of energy security. Um, which is very much the fore at the moment, but hasn't been in the past, um, but more around price security, perhaps and physical security. And the second is the uncertainty generated by the pace of decarbonisation and the redu reduction in, in gas demand, which, which for us has been the pervaded, you know, pervading source of, of, of insecurity in the future gas system. And that's really what I want to highlight today, you know, not dwell on the details of what's been happening recently. That was the first session. Um, although I'm happy to answer questions about that, but to think about what's going to happen 
let's say between now and 2030, 2035, you saw on Keith's graph, no unabated gas. So if I come to the next slide, Amber. You know, this is an issue that, that is, is, is starting to gain some visibility and, and it was noteworthy in the World Energy Outlook from the IEA last autumn. Um, they talked about the need for a managed transition away from gas. And unless the transition is well managed, they said remaining customers of natural gas would be at risk of supply shortages or volatility during the process of phasing out supply lines or delivery. And that's the basic challenge. How do you manage the phase down of the role of natural gas, both in your power system, but also in domestic, you know, domestic heat and the industry and decarbonizing industry? Um, and in the net zero strategy, and the government promised that uh, while they acknowledge that oil and gas will continue to play an important role as we transform uh, away from fossil fuels, if they said rather heroically, we will manage the transition in a way that protects jobs and investment, uses, uses existing infrastructure, maintains security of su supply and accounts for climate risk. Um, and my message is really quite, quite short and quite blunt. Well, show us the evidence. Where is this strategy to manage the transition? So if I could have the next slide. So we've got no shortage of documents out there. Um, very little actually said about natural gas and very little said about managing the transition in natural gas. Um, kind of just assuming, as I'll say, gas by default, that we'll have gas while we need it, it will be available and it will be secure. And, and that's a big question mark. And that's really what the sort of the question I want to pose. How do we do this? So the next slide, please. So if you look at the net zero strategy, I think, I mean, I, I wasn't party to early discussions um, in the Q&A, but I think most of us would acknowledge A, that it's, a, it's very supply driven and B, um, that it um, you know, doesn't say as much as it might on terms of short term supply. But, it, but again, it's very mixed and confused on, 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 what it, on the role on the future role of gas. Um, it's saying the future, future demand for gas will decline as we decarbonize. Um, saying that the gas system will need to change to meet the net zero targets. Well, gas demand has fallen significantly since 2000, and certainly in the power sector, um, the gas, the role of gas has changed dramatically, um, and that is, is having uh, consequences. They said that they, this is in the, the net zero strategy. They promised to consult last autumn on the future role of gas with a focus on infrastructure and markets. Now, clearly, they were otherwise occupied, but that doesn't mean they don't need to consult. And I think that we need to join up the dots and see that consulting on the future role of gas is critical to developing what I might call a British gas security strategy. So I'll go to the next slide. This should be familiar to, to many. It's showing the, the relationship between production uh, and demand in the UK. Uh, the production numbers are taken from the OGA or the Offshore Transition Authority, whatever they call themselves now. Um, and it's that balanced uh, net zero pathway that, that Keith was talking about, that's talking about future gas demand. I noted on his slide, actually, there was 15% of, of power generation was, was, was potentially gas with CCS or hydrogen. Um, and, and so that does keep a level of, of gas in the mix. And what this is showing, of course, is you know, as production continues to fall from the North Sea, uh, although demand is falling significantly, the import dependence going up. And I'm not sure it's a huge issue to worry about in the future, given the level of, of gas demand that's there. I'm sure that in, in the future, you know, future years, we will be able to secure that on global gas markets. If I could move forward, next slide. So back to the energy security strategy and what does it say? I mean, it has a focus on what I would call upstream physical supply. You know, and so the short term solution is that we need to get more out of the North Sea. Well, that's always been a long term commitment, maximizing economic recovery. Um, but the timelines on making a material difference are, are, are significant, and it's not even clear that there would be a, a surge in production. You're simply probably reducing the rate of decline. Um, they note the gas is currently the glue that holds our electricity system together, and it will be an important transition fuel. Um, and then they say we will send clear signals on the role of the, in, in the role of gas in the transition. But what they're offering to do on the following page in relation to gas is a new licensing round in the North Sea and a review of the shale gas moratorium, both of which obviously relate to physical, physical security supply and production in the upstream. Nothing to do with the changing role of gas in the energy transition. So okay, the next slide. So this is my final slide. It's you know, trying to find a simple way of summarizing what I see as the challenge. We've been, we've been saying for years that what we need is a new approach, gas by design, and kind of characterizing what we have at the moment as gas by default. And if you look at the way in which the UK government uh, through Ofgem and Bayes assess energy security and gas security, 
They say we have adequate infrastructure, enough pipes and terminals. We have a diversity of supply. And of course, quite fortunately, a very low level of dependence on Russian gas, although we're totally exposed to price, uh, secure, price security issues. Um, we are seeking to maximize economic recovery from the UKCS and obviously trying to get more out of, out of the ground. Uh, we rely on market forces to, to secure gas on global markets. And that's all right until the market delivers five, 600 percent increases in gas prices. But it does mean that the government has very few levers to pull in terms of addressing the gas price. I'm not sure that's a good or a bad thing. And then it's assumed that net zero policies will drive significant reductions, 40 percent fall in gas demand to 2030, which is the number which is in, in the uh, British Gas Security Strategy document. So that, I mean, that's where we're at now. You know, the existing system is adequate. We can find a bit more gas, but anyway, in the future, gas demand is going to fall. Gas by design asks a set of questions really about things we need to worry about. So managing the viability of gas, of gas infrastructure as demand falls. It's not a simple matter to dial down the gas and expect that all the infrastructure stays in place. It has to cover its costs and fewer consumers end up covering those costs. There's no sign of, of actually thinking about how we would manage the, a, a gas system in 2020, 2035 uh, with much, much lower levels of demand. At the same time, and, and I think Keith kind of alluded to this, gas is playing a significant role in the system today in terms of flexibility, both in terms of flexibility against variable renewable production, but also flexibility in terms of, of meeting winter heat demand. Our ability to replace that gas demand then depends on scaling up low carbon alternatives. And so the pace of doing that has an impact on the level of gas and feeds into the challenge of, of managing the infrastructure. Thirdly, um, we need to assess the energy security consequences of blue hydrogen. I mean, at the moment, the very high cost of gas is probably meaning that blue hydrogen is not in the money anyway. But if you look at the various projections produced by the likes of National Grid Committee on Climate Change, um, it is blue hydrogen that keeps methane in the mix. Blue hydrogen and a bit of gas plus CCS as a, a source of firm power to, uh, and flexibility. So that th those issues are ones really around the sort of energy system services that the gas, gas currently plays and the need to manage the decline in demand and the viability of the infrastructure are central to gas by, by design. But I, have to, I think we also need to prepare for the consequences of policy delay or policy failure in terms of the speed of decarbonizing domestic heat and industrial de uh, decarbonization for gas security. Because if it is the case that we don't make the progress that we need to make in a wider sort, you know, in those two areas, which actually is where the majority of gas demand lies to, today, we're gonna need more gas for longer. That's going to have energy security implications and it's going to have implications for the carbon budget. So what I'm suggesting is that we need a British gas security uh, strategy that's not based on the past, gas by default, but it's looking to manage the role of, the, of gas in the future, gas by design. And I'll leave it there. Fantastic. Uh, very, very interesting. And there's certainly some questions there around hydrogen that I'm sure we'll pick up. Uh, in, uh, in, in Jen's presentation as well, uh, encouraging participants as uh, um, audience members to, to type into the, 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 the Q&A. We've got a couple of new questions uh, that come in through this session, lots that we can hang over from the last session, but please start putting your, your questions in straight away. The sooner you write them, the better your chances of getting upvoted and therefore uh, that, that we, we come to your question. Uh, next contributor is Simon. Hi, Simon. Hey, Rob. Thanks very much for uh, inviting me and just want to start by just brief introduction. So my day job is just helping energy investors uh, navigate the energy transition. So hopefully can bring a, a commercial lens and an investor lens to this discussion. Uh, but as you mentioned, Rob, I previously was in government for 25 years, including leading the electricity market reform. So we'll share a little bit of uh, recollections of that that are relevant for the next round uh, of reform. So I was given the title, uh, one of the barriers to the deployment of low carbon generation. Just before I answer that question, let me just make a couple of comments to uh, support what's just been said. Uh, totally agree with everything that Keith just said about needing to do more on the demand side and uh, get the smarter energy system in place. Uh, so absolutely support that. 
Uh, I start also from the position we're going to need all the low carbon generation we can get as uh, we try to electrify both transport uh, and heat. Uh, and also that the ambition in the energy security strategies is welcome. It's good that the government is trying to double down on low carbon rather than back off. But I think it's all about delivery now. So coming to the question I was asked, uh, what are the main barriers to the deployment of low carbon generation? I think my I've got basically three points I want to make. Um, firstly, on renewables, uh, we don't see the problem as mainly being about the finance or the commercials. Uh, if the market frameworks are right, the money from investors will flow, as we've seen with offshore wind. Uh, the main barriers are now all about the non-financial barriers. So it's all about uh, the points I think Keith was referring to earlier, to do with planning, to do with consenting, uh, and increasingly uh, supply chain as well. But I'll, 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 I'll explain that in, in a bit more detail in a moment. For nuclear, I think it is slightly different. I think it's less clear who the project developers will be to build the uh, eight new nuclear projects that the government wants to see according to its energy security strategy. Uh, we've seen the delivery and cost challenges uh, with building nuclear projects, both at Hinckley, Flammerville and elsewhere. Uh, so uh, the Prime Minister wants to go at warp speed on new nuclear, but the track record is that we have managed to build one and a half reactors in 30 years in the UK. So I think there has to be question marks about the, the timeline there. And the third point really is um, sort of backing up what Mike was saying just a moment ago, if you accept that the nukes might not move at the warp speed that uh, the Prime Minister wants to see and that the offshore wind might struggle to get connected uh, in a timely fashion, uh, then that is going to leave a gap if we see electricity demand start to rise as we electrify uh, particularly transport and then heating. Uh, so I think I'd encourage all the Bayes colleagues on this call uh, in the REMA process we're about to hear about, you know, to focus on how do we get that flexibility into our power system uh, we need low carbon flexibility, so my encouragement would be to hold your nerve when it comes to uh, gas and CCS projects, to the development of hydrogen uh, power generation, and indeed uh, long duration storage, which we're going to need uh, all of those, plus, of course, much more active demand side if we're to avoid the situation where it's simply unabated gas that fills the gap uh, in terms of meeting power demand. So. Uh, those are my main points. Let me just um, unpick them a little bit in the remaining time I have. Um, I'll start with offshore wind, which, of course, has been celebrated as the great success story. I do just want to remind people that it certainly didn't feel like that 10 years ago when I was leading the electricity market reforms in 2013-14, uh, sitting in front of the PAC explaining why these projects are so expensive. Um, I think we held our nerve, and that's the point I want to make to the policymakers on this call. Uh, there will be wobbles and there will be calls that we don't have the money now to invest in CCS or hydrogen, the technologies that we're going to need, uh, as we heard from Keith earlier. Uh, my encouragement would be to say uh, to stick to, to fight through that and give uh, the investment community the long term certainty uh, that we did on offshore wind and the investment will flow. As I mentioned, the main barriers really to the faster deployment now are grid connections. There are also consenting problems. Uh, so it's good that Bayes have kind of recognised that in the energy security strategy with the commitments to reduce the time uh, for, for grid connections and uh, consenting problems. And of course, have started to address some of the challenges in terms of the uh, high level network design and the offshore transmission network review. I do think, though, there's a big issue and a big role here for the future system operator to play to develop that strategic national plan we're going to need for transmission uh, infrastructure. Uh, onshore wind uh, deserves a mention, of course, because, as we all know, the cheapest form of low carbon generation is one that is not really able to progress at the moment, uh, despite public support continually polling in the 80 uh, percent uh, range according to Bayes uh, and that's because of the change in the planning guidance that the government introduced in 2015 which they've confirmed they have no intention to change at the moment 
Uh, I think we have about 200 projects stuck in the system that would want to move forward. Um, but as the planning system is currently defined, I think only a handful will move ahead. There are interesting proposals uh, like we've seen from, from Octopus and others uh, about how you could incentivize communities to support local projects through uh, offering them lower bills in the immediate environment with that, where that project will be built. But I think we have to just accept that unless there is a change in the planning guidance, we won't uh, see the build out of onshore wind despite that public support. And that means we won't be getting to net zero at least cost because we will have turned off one of the cheapest ways uh, to get the low carbon electricity we need. A bit of a similar issue with, with solar. Uh, the government says it wants to see a five-fold increase uh, in solar by 2035. Many of those projects could be done on a merchant basis. They won't need a, a CFD. But again, the problems are not really financial or commercial. They are really all about planning. Uh, there are about 400 uh, solar projects in the planning system, many of whom I think will have connection dates if they're lucky uh, in 2028, 2029. And I think there are four gigawatts um, stuck with connection dates post 2030. So, you know, the the um, the ability of networks to invest ahead of need, which is obviously for Ofgem to consider, and then uh, how we speed up uh, the planning system. Obviously, the extra resources for the planning inspectorate welcome. Uh, I think those are the main barriers uh, in terms of solar. As I mentioned earlier, I think nuclear is uh, slightly different. Um, Government wants obviously to get to FID uh, on Sizewell this parliament and then two more projects in the next parliament and up to eight projects uh, over the next decade or so. The RAB model that's going through parliament in the form of the energy bill will, I think, help. Uh, but my question really is going to be about who are the developers who are going to come back to these uh, shores because uh, many have been and tried uh, and because of changes in our approach and our policy, um, I don't think necessarily will return. So there are delivery challenges there. There are also, as I mentioned earlier, uh, cost challenges and uh, uh, supply chain challenges uh, that must at least call into question whether the government can, as I say, move at warp speed, as the Prime Minister has said he wants to on nuclear. The track record suggests otherwise. And then finally, just to reinforce the point I made, um, which is we need flexibility in our power system. We need low carbon flexible generation. Uh, my plea really is for government colleagues to uh, hold their nerve when it comes to gas and CCS and hydrogen generation, as well as long duration storage, and then use the REMA process to encourage full chain flexibility in our power system. I think that's gonna be needed if we're to avoid the situation I mentioned where uh, just as we want everybody to buy an electric vehicle uh, and a heat pump, uh, the carbon intensity on our power grid starts to go into reverse because we default, uh, as Mike put it, to unabated gas. So I hope in 10 years time, Rob, you'll host another one of these and we can all look back on the fact that uh, policymakers did hold their nerve and we got that uh, flexible low carbon generation into our power system and we tackled some of the barriers I've mentioned uh, to the faster deployment of low carbon generation. Thanks. Thanks, Simon. <clears throat> uh, I hope so too. And I remember looking at the escalating costs of offshore wind in a, in a UKIP report and uh, predicting that we could get it down to below £100 per megawatt hour by 2025 uh, with a fair wind. So I'm very pleased to, to say that we were, we were wrong uh, and, uh, and uh, expectations were exceeded. And let's hope the same is true. Um, so the next, next, well, I might have swapped the order, but inadvertently, so apologies for that. But anyway, next up is, is, is Jen. So over to you. Thank you. I'm just going to hold, bear with me whilst I share my screen. Hopefully it should work nicely. Thanks. Perfect. Um, so I'm Jen Baxter. Hi, everybody. And I am the Engineering Director and Head of Proteum in Wales. And I'm going to talk to you today about the development of green hydrogen. Uh, I specialise in green hydrogen rather than blue hydrogen, so blue hydrogen will get a quick mention, but I'm not an expert in that area, so I'm not going to focus on it in too much detail. So the presentation today will just tell you a little bit about Proteum and what we do, a little bit about why we're doing it, 
uh, something about hydrogen production. And then what I really want to talk to you about, and some of it has been mentioned previously, is my experience of actually going out there and trying to deliver green hydrogen into our energy system and what I've learned over the course of the last two years. So my background before I was at Proteum was I was the chief engineer at the Institution of Mechanical Engineers. I was very much in energy influencing and supporting policy making. And my view on the world has changed dramatically in the last 18 months to two years on how we actually deliver this. So Proteum are a full value chain green hydrogen energy solutions provider. And what that means is that we actually develop, own and operate renewables and green hydrogen infrastructure to deliver dedicated zero emissions energy services to our customers. At the moment, we are just coming up to three years since we were founded and we're focusing on three main areas of green aviation and commercial transport, which actually are quite closely linked and also consumer facing industrials. And what that means is things like the food and drink sector where there is a heat demand required. So looking at industry fuel switching and increasingly we're starting to consider uh, the chemical industries as well. So there's just a pop out box at the bottom there about the UK government believes that hydrogen will provide between 20 and 35% of total final energy consumed by 2050. Now that's a significant amount of energy into our existing energy system. As many of you will know, it's about 20% electricity, 40% heat and 40% transport at the moment. So that means that hydrogen will be providing support probably across the two 40%. So moving on, um, I won't dwell too much on this because they have been mentioned before, but hydrogen has seen a really rapid increase in interest over the past probably three years. I've been working in the hydrogen sector since 2009 and really nothing happened until about three years ago and then everything seemed to start to happen and it really picked up and we've seen the creation of lots of different ways that hydrogen is mentioned in different strategies and there's the the main five gigawatt expectation that we've seen from the 10 point plan for uh, the green industrial strategy. So one of the things that are really driving this demand, so we've heard a little bit about gas prices, but I quite like this slide that is uh, was put together by our business development team, because what it really shows is that there's been an absolutely massive increase in the cost of natural gas. And so for a lot of industries that we work with, that means that the cost of their ability to produce the products that we then want to buy has gone up considerably. So they're starting to consider how they might be able to achieve both low carbon product development, but also be able to afford to do it. And that means that things like hydrogen start to become more interesting because electricity can require a, an extensive change of process, which costs a lot of money and can involve shutdown for a lot of industries. Whereas hydrogen can actually offer a much easier switch out and a fuel switch. So there, there are lots of opportunities for industry to think about how they replace their gas use with something else. And so the price is just one of those, but actually the ability to use the fuel that you want in the way you want is another. See the price of natural gas, and there's actually recently been a very large drop in the cost. And then you can compare that on the uh, graph on the right-hand side of your screen around the historic carbon credit prices. So very briefly, um, I'm hoping that most people have some idea about the way in which hydrogen is produced. And most people will probably know that there is a rainbow selection of different hydrogen production processes. And you can kind of uh, pick and choose from them. But in reality, there are probably three main ones that we talk about. And there is one primary production process at the moment. And that is what is currently called gray hydrogen. And that is where hydrogen is produced from Fossil fuels, it is put through something like steam methane reforming and we release CO2 to atmosphere and then we use the hydrogen within industries and other areas where we want it. We want to move away from that and so blue hydrogen is the next option that is being suggested and that is effectively the same as grey hydrogen but capturing the carbon dioxide as it leaves from the uh, steam methane reforming. So the area that I work in and which is a different process is green hydrogen and what we do in that area is we take a low carbon electricity source so usually renewables and you could consider nuclear in this area but it's not really considered green but it is still low carbon. Then you split water into hydrogen and oxygen and you can use the oxygen for lots of applications and hydrogen as you can see below in transportation and storage 
in the chemical industries, in potentially producing more energy should you require it. And for us, there are lots of opportunities in e-fuels as well. So we've heard quite a lot about how we're moving very quickly into hydrogen technologies. And there's a reason for this. And there's been this convergence of factors that's been happening really over the past two to three years that has been quite significant where we've seen real change. And that's around climate change targets happening in countries all over the world where previously they didn't have those in place. National specific hydrogen strategies, which means that different nations are looking at how they incorporate hydrogen into their low carbon planning. It, it says here a ban on internal combustion engine vehicles, but actually that's probably not really true. It's a ban on the use of fossil fuels within internal combustion engines. There are different ways that you can use an internal combustion engine, which can potentially be low carbon. And there is some research in that area. So then the private sector. So companies are really aware of the way in which their consumers view them. So science-based targets, ESG, really popular at the moment. If you just look at the jobs board on LinkedIn, the number of companies looking for ESG specialists is huge. And then we've seen a drop in renewable energy prices, and we hope to see a drop in the electrolyzer value chain. And that really just means that the more electrolyzers that are bought, the cheaper they will get. But actually, I'll get into some of the stuff on supply chain in a minute. And so that ultimately means that things like capex start to reduce and that the cost of hydrogen itself goes down. And storage and distribution. So historically, these have been real challenges in the hydrogen sector, but we're actually seeing solutions that are starting to make that look significantly easier. So this slide is just one that is useful to understand a little bit about where hydrogen can be used to reduce emissions, um, where perhaps in some instances, uh, electricity isn't the appropriate tool. And what I really want to emphasize here is the importance of choosing the right energy source for what you're trying to achieve, because in certain situations, electricity really isn't the right one. So where you're looking at things like off-grid machinery, mining, those kind of areas, it's very likely that electricity does not provide the level of power that you need for these vehicles. So there are lots of different companies looking at the way that hydrogen can allow them to continue to use their vehicles, and these are just some of those. So now to get onto the sort of stuff that I think is important, and it really has been a learning lesson for me. And one of them is around renewables development, and we've heard a little bit about that um, just in, in the presentation before this one. So on the ground, there's a huge disconnect with policy intention and the reality of delivery. So the time frame for renewables at any sensible size is around five to 10 years. And the reasons for that are the major developments and the development of national significance, which is the, the Welsh version. And the process is very long. Now there's no reason that we should remove any of those checks and balances that ensure that any project that we do does not impact the environment in a significantly negative way. We have to make sure that's in place. But there are some things that take an excessively long time. So anecdotally, a colleague of mine working on offshore uh, wind needs a license from the Crown Estates and has been told that it will take at least two years before they'll get that license. So that's two years before you start planning. The planning process can take between 12 months and three years. That's before you start construction. And then you get into supply chain challenges. So you know that you can be operating between three and five years before you start construction. And that's a really big challenge for net zero. So we also have spoken a little bit about grid and the investment needed for that. And in some areas of the UK, this is a really big issue. And it's an issue for hydrogen as well, because all hydrogen facilities at the moment need a grid connection. And that's whether you're exporting excess renewables to grid or in times of limited renewables used on your site, you need to bring in grid supply to allow you to continue to produce hydrogen for the sites where they need it. So you always need grid backup. And so that continues to be a challenge. And then there's the regulation. So one of the challenges we come up against is that the regulators are great, they're doing the best they can, but they're hugely under-resourced and potentially don't have the knowledge required for emerging net zero um, processes effectively. So you ask the question, and I don't know the answer to this, do you expand the current regulators and make sure that they have the capacity needed to deliver permitting faster? Or do you have a focused net zero regulator that specializes in these new and emerging technologies that we need to get into industry? So supply chain very quickly, I'm aware that I'm probably getting close to time. 
the, I tried to buy equipment. And so these are the things that we struggle with. Um, are there is the ability to get local grid networks so that's all of the materials and the people that go alongside that solar panels and electromechanical control systems green hydrogen production electrolyzers can take 12 to 18 months for, to actually arrive with you compression equipment storage tanks ancillary equipment all really difficult to get i mean and we're competing with all of the other companies who are trying to buy these things so you have to think that for net zero across the globe this means that this is a real challenge because most of this is not produced in the UK and we're trying to get it elsewhere. So when it comes to transport fuel cells, these are not produced in the UK and refueling equipment because obviously you need that as well. Again, not produced here. We have to make sure that we start to invest in being able to bring net zero supply chain to the UK so we can access it. And then we get into boilers and burners. There's a few big companies dipping their toes into this. But realistically, if we want to get to net zero as quickly as possible or anywhere close to it by 2050, we've got to get on top of our supply chain. And that then comes with skills. So again, um, working with across the whole value chain of green hydrogen, and this is just from my own experience and the fact that in the last 18 months, I've taught myself digitalization of assets, um, how to build digital twins, because we couldn't access the skills. And that's going to be really important for net zero, the ability to use our digital systems to understand everything from data to design to materials and, and manufacturing before you actually do it, it's vital. So these are all of the areas, including planning and law relating to hydrogen permitting and regulation. And once you get through design, digital materials, manufacturing, permitting, then finding people to actually construct your site becomes a problem people who have managed emerging new uh, assets or at least have the capabilities to do so, people who can service and maintain them, so all new skills, and then finally end of life management. So that goes loops back to the beginning that the design should be for end of life management. So all of these different skills are missing in our value chain or we just don't have enough of them. And so that's the end of, I can see that Rob's popped back up on the screen. So I will finish there and leave time for questions. Thanks, Jen. I was uh, I was a bit conscious of time. I didn't mean to have to hurry you. Um, that, so we've, if you could uh, take your screen share down, uh, we're going to have a couple of responses now. Uh, won't be more slides uh, from uh, Doug Parr from Greenpeace and uh, from uh, Rachel from uh, Bayes. I, I don't recall which which order we said we would take them in, but maybe Doug, if you could go first. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, thanks uh, very much for all those presentations, which I thought uh, had a lot of uh, really good stuff. I know Simon in particular always gets nervous when I keep agreeing with him, but uh, it is true that there are uh, many things to draw on there about the uh, about the role of uh, delivery of uh, of uh, of renewables. The things I come away from listening to this first of all i mean the context here is that we're talking about decarbonization and i'm always hit by the lack of urgency that we're showing in the uk even you know even though we're considered one of the better um better countries on this the lack of urgency when you compare to what's actually going on in the wider world um, decarbonisation is not an abstract issue if you're living in the Marshall Islands with, uh, with you know, getting regular flooding. It's not an abstract issue in um, India or Pakistan at the moment. It's a lived issue which is threatening livelihoods. Um, and it's already bad and it's going to get, keep getting worse. Um, so the sense of urgency, I feel, is not there across the board because whenever one looks at the the squeezing out of gas from the system, which is now the big challenge of, of decarbonisation on gas. One is constantly confronted by challenges. Some of them have already been alluded to. Um, the, um, you know, it's immensely frustrating to me that at least anecdotally, we have potentially billions of pounds of investment held up on offshore wind because the regulators don't have a couple of staff who can go through the uh, go through the applications um now but i have a i have another thing that i would like to raise uh, which is a bit more systemic um and it which is about the governance 
I think we've heard from Simon and others about the the need for and Jen, of course, about the offshore grid and the need to get that running up running. We have had the national grid say that you could save about 25% of costs if you had took a strategic approach rather than the um, outmoded approach that we currently have on offshore wind, which is uh, point to point connections for each individual wind farm, uh, nothing shared, nothing strategic, uh, no, in, no, um, no interrelationship between individual wind farms and, uh, and interconnection uh, with other European countries. Now, is that going to survive um, moving to the future system operator? Well, yes, I think it probably will. But then who owns it? Who operates it? How is that going to be delivered by who under what under what um, under what conditions? And we don't even have a. Uh, I'm not going to say we don't have a plan because there are things in process, but there, these are a lot of questions to resolve and they need to be resolved at some speed if we're going to get anywhere near this 50 gigawatt target for 2030 for offshore wind that has come out of the British Energy Security Strategy. So that's not that's not a physical question. That's a governance question. And um, the other thing that I would and I'm raising this because if we look at the way in which our current system, you know, both both parties within our uh, Labour and Conservative are both fighting shy of saying that we need to have um, big engagement with individuals so nobody's saying we need a in the face of a crisis we need a 60 miles per hour speed limit uh one of nick air's propositions uh, raised this morning um nobody's suggesting and either of the main parties or indeed any of the parties that i can know oh well if you can afford it and in your if you're in the wealthier then you turn your thermostat down now and yet we're coming to a point where there is going to have to be that kind of big engagement with individuals and individual choice when we come to heating. Um, are we seriously going to have whole streets and whole regions, uh, sorry, whole streets, whole areas converted to heat pump, but we're going to keep the gas mains going because Mr. Jiggins in 43 Acacia Avenue doesn't really want a heat pump? Now, I think the obvious answer is that's a crazy way to proceed. We can't keep that kind of gas infrastructure going over that period under those circumstances. And yet it doesn't feel to me we've even started to engage with the kind of challenges of governance that that requires to deliver it. Um, the electric vehicle infrastructure side is managing it's not ideal, but there's kind of cooperative arrangements um, being sought between local authorities, planning and uh, infrastructure providers and the networks. It's kind of it's kind of sort of working. Um, it's not great, but it's sort of working now. And it should be a lot easier. I mean, if we're going to roll out the level of public uh, public charging infrastructure, I think that that process needs to be easier. We need some obvious changes like net zero remit for off gem. Um, anticipatory investment and so on. So some of these governance things are reasonably clear, but I think for me, and I can, I can give you a list as long as a, a list of policies as long as your arm about what we should be doing. But for me, I think the governance challenges and the political blockages to the will, being willing to engage in those kind of challenges feel to me like emer they're emerging as some of the biggest challenges in terms of our overall delivery of this agenda and making that transition away from gas uh, as, as Mike laid out so well um, in a sort of managed and coordinated way rather than one that um, is, as he put it, gas by default, except it just kind of limbers on in zombie form when it, in, in, uh, um, in a very inefficient and costly way. So that's what I'm going to start with. Great. That's great. Thank you very much, Doug. Um, Rachel, over, over to you. And then we'll open it up to a general discussion and Q&A. Great. Thank you. So I'm Rachel Carey. Um, I co-lead the REMA policy team at Bayes with Will Broad. Um, so thanks a lot for inviting me along today and some really interesting 
um, presentations earlier. Um, I think uh, picking up kind of where REMA fits in across this huge uh, discussion that we've had this morning, um, I think it shows that there is a huge urgency to, to look at all these issues in the round. Um, and also that, um, I would say this, uh, REMA is only part of the picture, but a really important part of the picture. Um, I think obviously you can get the market signals right, but you need planning, network build, all of the different governance issues that Doug was just alluding to. Um, there's a whole system change here that is, is underway. Um, but the market signals are very important. So REMA is a, a really important project as well. And we'll be looking to consult um, uh, this summer on all the options. But I think one of the things that really flagged to me the presentation is that we see lots of um, growing problems and issues and the trilemma remains really appropriate for something that we need to worry about. You know, decarbonisation um, of a power sector by 2035 is, is really um, ambitious uh, target and we've made huge strides and but going that that extra way is is, is, is really ambitious. Um, and then cost and security supply are obviously really important. Um, sorry, I'm in a very uh, busy office. Sorry if it's uh, a bit loud. Um, but there are also huge opportunities. So I think we can get a bit sort of almost bogged down by the sort of challenges that this this transition throws up at us. But you know, we talked about the um, uh, excess renewable electricity that will be um, appearing un under all scenarios, really, um, and the, the huge benefits that could bring, and and you know, the, the electrolysis and uh, the availability of low cost uh, power, I think is something that we should really seek to maximize in our reforms. So really still seize the opportunities. Um, I think one of the things that we're starting to think about as well is that it, it's quite hard to come up with a set of market arrangements that work for everyone everywhere. So we're, we're thinking about some of the tensions that are at play. Um, you know, some technologies really like peaky prices, other technologies really want stable prices. So we're going to have to be really careful about thinking about how do we make sure markets are as open as possible to as wide a range of participants, but also what do the full set of um, reforms mean for individual technology types, given that we are going to need such a broad range of technologies and we are going to need to engage the demand side. Um, and we are thinking about flexibility from a, a huge range from the sort of uh, really small scale DSR, uh, new forms of demand side response in EVs and heat pumps, yeah. aggregated, all the way up to really large CCUS hydrogen to power projects. We're gonna need market arrangements that accelerate the investment in, in those um, forms of flexibility so that they can go hand in hand with um, accelerated investment in renewables. Um, and then I think the other big uh, challenges that we have is on location and operability. So those are issues that we're going to look at. On location, we know that uh, there are both investment signals that can be sent by the, the markets, um, but also an operation as well. And we need to get the right balance between um, investment signals where people can respond to them and operational signals so that you can operate the system efficiently. Um, on operability, we know that it's a, a kilowatt is not a kilowatt. So we need to think about all the system services that we need. Um, so different uh, types of generation have different properties and different durations. So we need to uh, make sure market arrangements uh, bring forward the full range of system services that we need as well. Um, so I see this as a really exciting challenge and something that we all, all need to work together on. Um, there's a huge range of uh, ideas out there and we want to be really um, systematic in how we evaluate all those options and many of them have costs and benefits and it's evaluating those so yeah that that was that was me rob thanks cool rachel um can everyone hear me i've just switched to a um a microphone and some headphones because i've got some background noise here myself we obviously hit bay's lunchtime uh, rachel everyone's walking past your little pod um could i ask everyone else uh, to put their cameras 
uh, back on and uh, we're going to go to a, a, a general uh, panel discussion now. Um, I think what I'll do is, I, I, I see Simon, you're going to have to drop off. We've got the Chancellor's statement. Um, I think it would be interesting to actually reflect a bit on, on what we think might happen uh, with, this, with the statement from the Chancellor um, later this afternoon. Um, we've had some questions also that I'd like to carry over from this morning's chat, as well as some, some new ones that have popped up uh, before. But let's just see if we can take the windfall tax uh, question head on. So I think one of the morning questions was, or a couple of them, two or three of them, in fact, should we, why aren't we talking about windfall tax? What do we think about the idea of a windfall tax? And I wonder if anyone's got any thoughts uh, and wants to um, wants to take that one head on. Doug. Um, yes, uh, we're in favour of a windfall tax. Um, uh, you know, we'll find out more. At, apparently, the statement is now 12.15. I'm being messaged. Um, but we're in favour of it. Um, because uh, partly, I mean, just as a just as a matter of basic equity, um, I think the only one of us who actually raised the question of just transition was Mike. Um, and I think it's a real one. If you're going to go to, um, if you're going to decarbonize, you will need to do it in a fair way. Um, because Otherwise, you know, if you just try and um, do it by um, technologies and price signals and carbon prices, then some people are going to be left behind um, and facing the heat or eat dilemma. And I don't think that's a fair way to do it. So our proposition, which was actually to raise the level of um, tax take from um, domestic oil and gas producers to the global average tax take, um, the current tax take in the UK is 40%. Um, the global average is currently 70% from the offshore oil and gas regimes. And um, our calculations from Oil Change International and uh, the rice, using Reistad numbers uh, is that that would generate an additional 13.4 billion uh, just in one year, uh, which would do a lot for um, the 6 billion, six million households most exposed and you would also get some money that you could start rolling out for the energy efficiency program that are going to be one of the answers to uh, to this program so yeah very much in favor okay uh, doug i mean i'm keen to to to, yeah. to keep keep going a bit more a bit quickly so does anyone else want to take make any thoughts or comments on the the, the goodness or badness of a uh, of a windfall tax simon do you have any uh, thoughts on that uh it's all Devil's in the detail, Rob, as to how it gets done. And there are rumours about incentives for companies that continue investment plans, you know, getting some sort of rebate off the increase. Um, I was still in deck for the last hike in the supplementary charge in 2011. I can assure you that did hit investment. Um, and we can't afford that right now if we're to get the investment in the low carbon technologies, because a lot of these companies are uh, investing in just the low carbon technologies we need. So I think the devil's in the detail. And the other point I'd make is I hope uh, the money is targeted and not spread across all households. Uh, we need to target it on those that need help, the most help, rather than uh, effectively spreading it uh, thinly across all households to those that don't need it because the rise in energy bills is extreme and hitting uh, poorer households disproportionately hard yeah simon and that's something that joanne made this the exact, the exact very similar point this morning uh, in, in the earlier session this morning that we don't all need it and those that do are where it should be targeted um and i think that although ukirk doesn't have a, an official line on windfall tax one of the other uh main points that i wanted to get across this morning was to just to give an, an indication of the scale of the, the materiality of uh the potential for uh, doing things within the wholesale electricity market so uh you know we were talking about perhaps you know between five and 20 billion pounds uh, potential uh, bill reduction uh if we weren't over remunerating uh um renewables and nuclear to the extent that we we currently are uh, and that there are uh, electricity therefore there is a kind of parallel conversation uh, that needs to be understood about not just uh, using the fiscal system uh, to, to try to um, recompense the poorest individuals, but also to think both in the short term and the long term 
uh, about the fundamentals of our electricity markets. And that's why we're seeing interventions across Europe uh, in wholesale markets. Um, so Keith, uh, I can see that, that both you and Mike uh, have your hands up. Um, so if you could be fairly quick, because there, there's quite a number of wide ranging topics I want to try and get. Us yeah, to. I mean, it's just, Rob, it's just to support that point about fairness. Absolutely. That's, that's definitely something that you know, we've said in the CCC is going to be really important. Uh, I mentioned in the first session this morning, the importance of understanding the sort of distributional effects. That's just reinforcing the point there, really. And fairness, of course, you know, about where the costs are picked up. But it's also important in terms of continuing to have support for the transition as well. That things are right. fair and seem to be fair. Yeah, I understand. Mike? Yeah, I guess I'm, I, I, I'd agree entirely about more targeted, but I also think your point about it, it's not just about oil and gas companies here because of the way the market's been operating. There are other 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 companies which have been making you know, making extreme profits. It is a windfall tax, and you know we have we are in extraordinary circumstances with the energy prices that we face. Um, but I think we need to think hard about the longer term consequences of anything we do now in an emergency. You now, I think that Simon mentioned the issue about not wanting to, to dissuade investment in low carbon. I think the government also has to think about you know, potential contradictions between you know, maximizing economic recovery, its energy security strategy, whether I, I think it's a good idea or not. The UKCS is a very is a mature base in an international competition. Um, and it, it, it may be that that's the right thing actually to leave it in the ground. Um, but I think we need to think about it's a short term windfall tax that we're looking at here. Let's not make things worse in the longer term in terms of making adjustments to the tax regime, particularly on the, on the renewable side. It's uh, uh, a good point, Mike, and, uh, um, and one that I think, again, resonates with some of what we've been trying to, to suggest uh, with you, Kirk, uh, in terms of thinking about a trade off that actually builds an incentive for ongoing investment through our kind of pot zero CFD idea that we talked about earlier. I'm going to change topic uh, completely now. Uh, there's been a number of questions in the, uh, in the chat that relate to the role of nuclear. So it seems as if that we shouldn't ignore that elephant in the room. Uh, I'll try and paraphrase in, in the words, I think, of Jürgen. Uh, is why are we so, are we obsessed uh, with new nuclear? Um, uh, should we be so obsessed? And one of the other uh, contributors was asking, I think about uh, uranium availability, proliferation concerns, and so on. Uh, I, I'm sure that Doug will have a view on that, so I'm not going to come to him first. Uh, would anyone of the other participants like to, uh, to to pick up on that? Warp speed is warp speed the thing? Uh, modular reactors will they save us? Uh, any any responses on that one? Right, go on then, Keith. Well, we can't have no response, can we? So, um, I mean, you know the. I mean, I think I think a lot of the challenges are, are quite well articulated, but there's not a lot of evidence yet to kind of uncover them other than evidence that doesn't look very favorable, such as on the delivery timescales. You know, we know that the stations that have been committed to in recent years, at least in Europe, have taken a long time to deliver. So we'll see how Hinkley Point C goes. As for SMRs, I, I wanted reactors, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I think it still seems there's a lot of, and my understanding is there's a lot of different variations on the theme that are out there and have been proposed. Uh, you know, I think Rolls-Royce submitted uh, their paperwork to the Office of Nuclear Re Regulation for a kind of, you know, type assessment uh, this, you know, th this year. So I guess I guess we can say things are progressing. But I think I think the questions about, you know, the, the, the materials and where the fuel come from are, are very, very good, good questions. But, we, you know, it, but, you know, unavoidably, these things take take time. So, you know, uh, it, by going at warp speed, you don't want to warp the you know, the kind of uh, viability of the materials that you're using and so on. Keith, okay. uh, Mike? Yeah, I think it, it comes back to, I think, first of all, we need to recognise that we've got you know, a potential flexibility gap emerging as we've got to retire the vast, you know, all but one of the existing nukes, plus quite a few CCGTs are going to be past their sell by date, you know, and so it's this, what I was talking about in my presentation about the consequences of delay or policy failure which ultimately are going to mean this gas by default approach because we've got to somehow plug the gap. That will raise issues around stranded assets if we start investing in new gas generation capacity. So I think we have to think about those problems. I think more generally, there's lots of questions about who supplies what. It's not just uranium. 
It's all right, also around, you know, all sort, we talked about the supply chain issues around hydrogen. You know, one of the consequences of a current focus on energy security is to start asking those questions about everything and looking about near shoring and ally shoring of, of, of sources of critical materials, um, processing capacity and, and so on and so forth. So I think it's, a, it's an important point, but in, in the longer run, it may encourage, I think, as was being suggested uh, by, by Jennifer, building domestic capacity to do a lot of these things. I'm not talking about the uranium supply, but also some, some of those low carbon supply chains. I mean, Kazakhstan is also a major supplier of, uh, of uranium, um, and I think also the United States. But I think, again, there's a whole long list of materials we're asking those questions of. Okay, Mike. Uh, Simon? Yeah, just to support that view, uh, there's obviously a case for new nuclear because you're going to need all the low carbon electricity you can get your hands on. But can it really contribute materially new projects to a net zero power system by 2035? I mean, that's that's the question, isn't it? And um, we've delivered, as I said in my remarks, one and a half nuclear power stations in 30 years. So we've just got to face into that delivery track record that Keith referred to and the cost challenges of getting it down, getting costs down uh, to something more comparable with where renewables are today. If we we need to address that that gap issue that Mike talked about, it'll be unabated gas that will fill the gap, and that is not going to help us get to a net zero power system by 2035. So we need to be thinking about a low carbon flexible generation to complement the renewables and, and all the demand side measures we talked about earlier. So yeah, that, that's you know that is something I hope base colleagues are really seeking to address. Okay, thanks, um, Doug. Has Greenpeace changed any of its views on, new, on, on nuclear? You're muted. Uh, sorry, no, we haven't changed any of our views. Still think it's a really bad idea. Uh, I'd say there were um, three areas. One of the one of the core issues of uh, nuclear, you know, to do with waste, um, uh, accident. Uh, and one the thing that doesn't get much profile in the UK is proliferation. Um, the uh, the nuclear proliferation issue around new nuclear reactors um you know you can see it playing out in the middle east and um and i can go on about that but you know in the interest of time i won't there's there's certainly two other issues uh, one is um what's actually on the table um smrs are theoretical at this point in time um none of them have been built anywhere in the world except possibly one in China although we don't know much about that you know Chinese government nuclear industry transparency does not bring um so the idea that we should be basing our I mean you know they're, they're less advanced than tidal power right so why why do you want to base any kind of strategy around around something that's never been built where we don't know what the what the real costs are and they the sort of things that are being proposed by rolls-royce are not simply the same as what they put in nuclear submarines so i don't think that's um that's really right and the you know in terms of the big reactors the epr shocking record both both eprs in china are now offline um one uh, has been offline for approaching a year because of problems with fuel uh, and and vibration um it's not clear they know how to solve that it's been really over budget really over cost and really late everywhere it's been tried to build built in europe and so why why the enthusiasm i mean i don't see anything else being judged in that way and that's for the ap 1000 you know there's been tried to Two, two stations in North America. One was abandoned when it was nearly half built because the costs over and nearly bankrupted Toshiba. And the third point is distraction. You know, we've seen from the COVID epidemic just how, uh, how the bandwidth of government contracts when it's confronted with, uh, when it has to do stuff uh, and do difficult stuff. Um, that's quite understandable. Now, if you've got a lot of people trying to get something that isn't very good, away at the sort of scale that the government is talking about, then, they, then, then that's a lot of people who can't be doing something else. And the last count um, that went to the public domain, there were more people working on new nuclear than there were on new renewables and clean heat put together. Now, even, you know, you look at the 25% of that is proposed in the energy security strategy, a 25% number about which there can be considerable skepticism has already been expressed considerable skepticism and that means that the other 
70 odd percent is mostly going to have to come from other sources of clean power, particularly renewables. Um, and there are some major problems with uh, delivering of renewables, which are not getting the attention that they deserved, as I alluded to earlier. So there's three issues, core issues, what's on the table is a bit rubbish, distraction. And that's why I think it's a really bad idea that um, the UK government is so enthusiastic about nuclear. Fine. <clears throat> Greenpeace view has not changed at all, uh, and that's fine, and that's completely fair enough. I should stress that UKIRK is completely and very strictly agnostic about nuclear power, and there are a range of views from within our consortium. Uh, I am quite keen not to spend too much, and in fact, very, very quick from, from, from Jen. And Keith, is your hand back up, or is it a legacy? My hand was back up, just to make the point about flexibility and what it means. Um, so, I mean, I, for, I forgot to make the point earlier when I was showing my uh, residual demand curve that I think the whole concept of baseload electricity generation is an outdated concept. If you have uh, that residual demand curve that was always above a certain positive level, then yeah, you can switch something on and leave it going as baseload that never, never needs to do anything else to switch it on and keep it going for as long as you can. But the fact that that, that curve flex is you know, so variable and, and you know, that loses a lot of the point by the way I showed it, sorting it from right to left. What happens within a day, the ability to ramp up and ramp down, to flex, really to flex to meet the variation of that review of demand, that doesn't necessarily lend itself to, you know, the kind of, you know, the, the kind of traditional designs of nuclear power stations, basically, where, where you know, they're not, not very good at flexing. Okay, Jen. Um, I'll contain my internalized screaming about this, but um, there is a few issues here. One, Doug mentioned that no other energy source is judged the way that nuclear is. And he's absolutely right. We don't talk about other generations the way that we do about nuclear. We scrutinize it beyond anything, and yet it has the best safety record of all of our energy production sources. The second point is on what are we using our energy for? So we tend to talk about it in quite a, if if I can use the term, a sort of slightly um, old fashioned way, we're just gonna put it into the grid, but actually you could use nuclear power station sites for all sorts of things where it doesn't even need to leave the site. You could produce everything from uh, hydrogen to e-fuels to chemicals all in the same area and it wouldn't be a base load. It would be doing its own job entirely separately. And then finally on sustainability and assets. We have a little bit of a tendency to want to knock everything down and rebuild. And from a sustainability point of view, that's a really bad idea. So where we're turning off coal-fired power stations, we have grid connections, we have land, sometimes huge amounts of land that is no good really for a lot of things, could actually potentially be used for other energy sources, including nuclear, where you can minimize the amount of land use that you're going into. Because one of the issues um, and renewables are fabulous, they really are, but they just don't perform and they aren't as efficient as nuclear power is, and they take up considerably more land. So there are different ways of thinking about our energy system that isn't just ram it all into the grid and take it all out again. And I think we have to start to consider things a little bit more laterally than, than the conversation is perhaps allowing for. So I just leave it there. And that's a personal view, that's not a protean view. That's completely fine. And it's actually very welcome to have given a, a, a rather different perspective uh, on uh, uh, on the on new nuclear. I won't put Rachel on the spot because we are on the record and we're being recorded. Uh, instead, I think I'll let's have another session talking about nuclear, a, new, a real proper uh, 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 discussion of these issues. Uh, no, no holds barred. But for now, I'm going to move us on. Um, I'm actually going to take us back to the first question that was put into the QA from uh, Roger, who I assume is Roger Bentley. And he's got, referring us back to the peak oil report that UKIRK produced back in 2009. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna paraphrase. Should we have anticipated the gas price crisis based on what we know about fossil fuels, their price volatility, or indeed I think, you know, their limited ultimate supply so who'd who'd like to have a a, a a first crack at that one well maybe I'll, i want to look to other colleagues here who know much more about the gas sector than, than i do but i think i did come across an iea report from uh sort of september time ish that uh, was already talking about you know or maybe before, before that global gas prices uh, climbing significantly 
so it's a shame that um, Simon from the IEA isn't still with us in this this second session to, to see if my memory was was correct on that. But um, I think Mike made the point that you know in the in the medium to long term, certainly, uh, you know, fossil fuels are going to be left in the ground, at least in respect of their you know potential to to lead to greenhouse gas emissions. And I suppose there are going to be convulsions in the sector as as uh, you know, yeah, well, we hope it will have a graceful exit rather than a violent one. Mike. Yeah, it's really around the question about thinking, well, what's causing this current price crisis? And the price crisis does predate um, uh, the war in Ukraine. Uh, and also cast your mind back to the world in late 2019, early 2020, we had an oversupply of fossil fuels on the market. We had very low gas prices. And, and you know, gas industry was worrying about whether um, there was sufficient incentive to invest in new LNG capacity, for example. And then the pandemic, of course, uh, the gas fared better um, because of its role in power generation and it wasn't exposed to the transport sector. Um, but but there, were, there, was, there was a period in, in 2020 when scheduled LNG exports out of the United States never got liquefied because it simply wouldn't cover the cost of liquefaction given the price of gas in, in Europe. Um, now, the reason we had the price, price spike coming out of the pandemic in, 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 in Europe and North America was, was really a sort of classic supply demand situation that during the pandemic, there were various things that took out elements of supply, um, including Russia ramping down its upstream production. There were technical problems. There was a delay in maintenance. All of these things meant that the gas supply side was relatively tight as, as demand surged. Um, and there were all this, also issues in Asia that, that had spiked demand. Um, and so that drove up very high prices. And, and then we kind of crash into the situation in, in uh, where we find ourselves in now in Europe, where we know it's not a lack of gas supply. It's, you know, what Malcolm Wicks called that geopolitical energy security risk. We don't want to buy gas from Russia. Actually, prior to that, gas, gas supply from Russia was being constrained. Or, you know, we now, you now recognize that they were softening us up for what was about to happen. It's these short-term issues of supply and demand and volatility. They're always there. They're always there in the LNG industry. What tends to happen is we have a price spike and everyone goes away and, and makes investment decisions to produce more LNG. Uh, that By the time those projects come online, they've overbuilt and the gas price goes down until the demand consumes it and so on. So you have that volatility. The bigger question actually here is what does all of this mean for the future demand of natural gas? You know, because natural gas, even in the IEA, you know, they, they talked about the role of natural gas in the energy transition, seeing a natural gas delivering a decarbonization role in Asia, albeit relatively short term, getting rid of coal. What does the very high price of natural gas, and we've seen it discussed in terms of the relative cost of, hydro, blue, of green hydrogen, for example, the very high price of natural gas and the security concerns associated with gas mean about how people are looking about the future role of gas. Put another way, how much demand destruction comes from this? I'm not worried, about, there's plentiful gas. It's the question of matching supply and demand and more interestingly, what happens with demand destruction going forward? The gas market will rebalance, prices will come back down, coming back to you know, not making decisions in a, in, a, in a crisis. Don't make decisions on, a, on other sources of energy, assuming these gas prices will be there forever, they won't. In, you know, the investment cycle will return the gas, the market will achieve equilibrium, and it may be the crisis drives an acceleration of demand destruction. Okay, um, we've lost Simon. Uh, the reason that we've lost Simon is that he has to respond to the Chancellor uh, making his statement. The Chancellor has now started making his statement, uh, and it's possible that others on the call uh, need uh, to be making press statements, possibly including uh, Doug. So uh, if you need to, if you need to drop off, Events, events, events uh, have possibly uh, 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 taken greater priority uh, than and anyway we're due to wrap up in a few minutes. So if you need to drop the, from the call now, please uh, do. Um, if not, then I think um, I'm not going to try and take any more of the of the Q and A. And I do apologise to all of those that we don't um, get to. They've certainly stimulated uh, discussion. Um, Callum McIver, one of our colleagues, has posted that. Um, there is the announcement is four hundred pounds to all households and up to six hundred pounds additional targeted to those on means tested benefits. So I don't know whether that's all being funded through a windfall tax. It, I don't know how it could be to be honest. So it must be coming uh, from general taxation. 
Uh, can we do a quick round? Who would like to make uh, any final remarks, responses to anything that they've seen in the chat? I'll start with Jen. So there was just one very quick one from the chat, which I was struggling to um, answer directly uh, in there, is on the oxygen use from hydrogen production. So just to say that there are multiple uses for oxygen that can range from use in water treatment right through to various uses in different industries. So it's I, the ideal situation is that you, you use it and you commoditize it rather than that you um, allow it to go to atmosphere. Okay. Uh, Rachel, do you have any final thoughts, observations? Sorry, Rob, was there a particular question you wanted me to answer? No, not really. Just if you wanted to pick up on anything that you can see in the Q&A, or if there's just anything you'd like to say uh, in kind of in closing. No, predictably, I'm in a, in a rather sort of uh, can't say much until our consultation's out, but I look forward to working with you all. I, I, I really appreciated what you said about not being able to make one size fit all within the energy, uh, within the current design of the electricity market. Or, And I would argue you can't make that in any design of the electricity market. And there will always be a need for uh, some targeted interventions because big generators are not the same as small flexibility providers come in many forms. And, um, you, you know, how we reach particular consumers and demand response is another question again. Uh, but good luck with it. It's a major challenge. So um, very quick, uh, I think what I'll do then is just um, given given the time, I think I might give the last word to um, uh, to Doug as, as one of our externals rather than uh, us, you, Kirkus. So uh, any last uh, comments or thoughts or responses to the chat, Doug? I haven't seen any specific questions for me. I, I would just reiterate the point that um, the governance arrangements are going to be critical for making this work, including uh, what you've been doing, Rob, on, on uh, pot zero and how those kind of all mesh together. Um, and I, I do worry that when we talk about individual technologies, which, you know, I mean, I love talking about individual technologies, if, if they're not if they're not meshing properly, not just in a physical sense through the flexibility of the grid, which of course is really important, but in terms of how the rules are made and and uh, and the bodies and responsible for the delivery of this, I think um, I think we're going to struggle. Okay, I think I'm uh, I'm quite minded to end it there and thank you all uh, for, for for your contributions. Uh, apologies again to all of the questions that we didn't get to. Uh, in, in the excellent chat uh, Q&A that we've, uh, we've had this morning. I know that we've had a large number of attendees. Um, I think it's very important to emphasize that this is not the end of a conversation. It's just the first of a, of a whole range of activities, events, podcasts, blogs, working papers, uh, briefing papers, and all manner of other things that we're trying to do at UKIRK, working with uh, fantastic partners like the Energy Institute and the Royal Academy of Engineering. Uh, we intend to do something a bit like this in the early autumn, where we come back together again and see how we uh, how things have changed and how things are shaping up. Um, and things are clearly shaping up right now uh, with this announcement that's being made about uh, extra provision for next winter. So I thank you all again, and uh, I'll leave it there. Thanks very much for all of your contributions. Bye. 